first physician student at the Silverstein Institute. She graduated with honors 11 years ago from the University of South Florida Communication Science Department where she got her audiology degree. So please join me silently in welcoming Dr. Lynette Thornton. All right, I'm going to stop the share, and then I'm going to um, remove the spotlight from Ed, and I'm going to have to find you where you where you land. Okay, Lynette, spotlight you. Okay, so you can click on it's all yours. So click on the share screen. There you go. All right. I'm going the wrong way though. Okay. So thank you guys for having me today. I have uh, my friend and boss and colleague, Dr. Sharon Rende over here uh, with me as well. I have the tendency to get a little technical when I give these talks. So I have uh, Sharon here to help uh, simplify things and explain things in a, a bit less sciencey, technical engineering type of way. Okay, so um, let's get started. Wow, what a big time in uh, the hearing industry right now. Uh, we've been waiting for October 19th of this year to happen. We were expecting it in August of 2020, but uh, interestingly, I had offered to give this talk well before that October 19th um, uh, landmark uh, ruling came out. So I had a lot of reading to do to catch up <laughs> to, to supplement this talk with all of the updates. So I'm excited to be here and I'm excited um, to share my thoughts on this with you. So of course I have to do my presenter disclosure. Uh, financial, I am a clinical and research audiologist at Silverstein Institute, First Physicians Group. I am also a dispensing audiologist through an LLC called Concierge Hearing Devices. Non-financial, I'm a member of AAA, ASHA, and I'm also the audiology consultant for the Ear Research Foundation. Uh, and possibly the most important uh, disclosure on here is that Every product that I'm going to mention, I'm not trying to advocate for any specific thing. Uh, when Ed and I first spoke about me giving this presentation, the thing that I wanted most was to give persons with hearing loss unbiased information. And that's truly my objective. So any opinions that I express are solely those of mine, not my employer, not of the foundations or academies that I'm a part of, okay? Um, let's see here. Oh, Deb, uh, Debbie, I'm sorry. Are we going to do the polling questions? I'd like oh, to get yeah. a feel for my yeah. audience to yeah. kind of get a gauge of who I'm talking to. Okay, here's the poll, please. Please check off which one of the following statement best describe you. I have a hearing loss and current wear hearing aids. I suspect I need hearing. I need a hearing. I suspect. <laughs> I suspect I have hearing loss and may need a hearing aid. I believe is what that's supposed to say. Okay. You want to read the other two just so that. Sure. I am here to help a loved one or friend. Uh, consider what hearing device they should consider. Or I'm currently a hearing healthcare provider looking for more insight into OTC. And then Ooh, I've got one. Go ahead. All right. So we have kind of a mixed bag. Nice to see another fellow hearing care provider. If you share, uh, if you do not share my opinions on OTC, uh, don't tar and feather me just yet. Hear me oh, out. No. Okay, so uh, let's get started here. Okay, hold on a second. 
I'm going to share the results so you can see it. Oh, okay. So the results. So most people here have hearing aids. A um, couple of you think you may need some hearing aids, but not quite sure yet. I like to see that there are people here as a support system for those that um, have hearing loss. That's pretty amazing. Um, you're going to see a quote a little bit later on in my slides uh, that I love, and it speaks to that point exactly. And I do have one person that is an audiologist or hearing instrument specialist. Very cool. Okay. Somewhat unlikely, very unlikely. Gotcha. Okay. Well, let's see. Uh, let's see uh, how this goes. Let's start having a chat here. I'm trying to minimize this poll, but it's getting stuck in my way. Okay, so what am I trying to achieve today when I'm giving this talk? Well, first off, I think we've all been waiting a long time for a definition of what is an OTC hearing aid. Uh, so I do intend to go over that. Also, what's the difference between an OTC hearing aid and the prescribed ones that we are so used to um, you know, seeing providers to get and having hearing tests to get and all of the appointments and all of the things. So what's the difference there? Also, what exactly is it that determines if a patient is going to be successful with a hearing aid? Is it the type of hearing aid? Is it the person doing the fitting? Is it both of those things? Is it the patient? It could be a lot of those things and we're gonna kind of break it down. Um, and then lastly, I want to help hopefully guide uh, today's attendees to see if maybe an OTC hearing aid is something that they wanna consider for themselves or a loved one, or if maybe given our talk, it's uh, determined that maybe a, a more prescribed hearing aid would be appropriate. Why do we need a talk like this? Well, a lot has happened in the last couple of years. Uh, we are in the middle of legal and regulatory changes rapidly. The entire landscape is changing. Uh, you see an abundance of things on the market. You can't open a newspaper or click on an internet browser these days without being inundated with uh, what are now called OTC hearing aids. Uh, and they have been using that term in marketing since the 2007 uh, bill, which I'll get into a little bit later. Uh, but yeah, there's just a lot of uh, not wonderful marketing going on out there. And I'm finding that there's a lot of bad information. There is essentially no unbiased information for patients or consumers out there. Uh, a lot of my colleagues disagree with my stance on over-the-counter hearing aids, and, and that's, that's fine. Um, they're, you know, they're entitled to that, but, you know, don't tar and feather me yet. Listen to me. Let's see if I make some sense here, and maybe I can sway you to the dark side. Uh, but, yeah, so I want to present some unbiased information um, that's based in, in actual research and science. So without further ado, here we go. What is an over-the-counter hearing aid? Well, kind of a brief history of how we got to where we're at. Back in 2017, Elizabeth Warren and uh, Chuck Grassley in a you know, once-in-a-lifetime bipartisan agreement decided to co-sponsor a goal called the Over-the-Counter Hearing Aid Act of 2017. And the goal was basically to make hearing aids more affordable. They wanted the devices to be available for adults. Now that was an important thing. Adults with perceived mild to moderate hearing loss. I think what got a lot of people up in arms, and I will be honest, I was up in arms when I first saw this uh, back in 2017. Perceived mild to moderate hearing loss. How on earth, is a patient going to determine <laughs> what their degree of hearing loss is? What does a mild hearing loss even mean? On a daily basis, I have patients come in with a severe loss that don't think they have a problem. 
or I have patients with completely normal hearing that think they for sure have a significant loss. So the perceived thing I think is where a lot of hearing healthcare professionals um, and audiologists, that, that's I think what we had a problem with. Uh, and the idea was for these devices to be direct to consumer, to not require supervision or prescription or intervention or, or involvement in any way of a licensed professional. Now, one thing that is important is when this bill was passed, it was a federal law, which means it preempts state and local laws. So even if your state still has laws actively on the books against over-the-counter, this bill overtook that. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, so the problem with this 2017 bill was uh, it was really short and it didn't really say a whole lot. They basically gave the FDA three years and they said, hey, FDA, here's your job. You've got three years to figure it out. Well, that should have happened in about August of 2020. Well, that didn't happen, but let's be fair. FDA had a couple of other issues in the last couple of years, you know, global pandemic and all. So we've been basically waiting this whole time. What is it going to be? What is an OTC hearing aid going to look like? How is it going to be regulated? We had no idea. And in the meantime, you've got audiologists and everybody um, really kind of freaking out about the whole situation. You know, chicken little, the sky is falling. Um, it, it, was, it was a very unsettling feeling to think that our patients may not be getting adequate care. Uh, and then we see all the unscrupulous advertising where products are labeled as OTC hearing aids from the day this bill passed. Well, the fact remains that OTC hearing aids, we didn't even know what they were until just recently, until like a week ago, two weeks ago. Anyway, so with all of what I just said, how does that leave the patient? How does that leave the consumer? I don't even know what OTC hearing aids are doing. How can a person not intimately involved in the field have any idea, especially with all the misinformation? So yeah, that's why this talk today is so important. For years and years, since I've been in the field, I've been an audiologist 11 years, but I've been dispensing hearing aids for 15 years through Veterans Affairs. Um, we had two things. We had a traditional hearing aid, and then you had a PSAP, which is a personal sound amplified um, amplifier product or something like that. The biggest difference was a hearing aid was an FDA, regulated medical device. And we could make medical claims about that. We could say it is used to treat hearing loss. A PSAP on the other hand, I'm getting, yeah, I think maybe, okay. Um, a PSAP on the other hand is a recognized category. Now that this is a very big distinction in medicine and, and FDA coverage, so I want to take a moment to highlight it. Does everybody understand the difference between FDA regulated and FDA registered? Huge difference. FDA regulated means the FDA is making you go through critical loops and hoops to prove that your device, your medicine, your whatever is effective and they monitor it. FDA registered means that a company sent some papers to the FDA and it got filed in a shelf somewhere. There's absolutely no oversight over uh, registered. So registered versus regulated, that is a huge, uh, huge difference. And the purpose of that was, so you've got this other thing, the FDA says, yes, we know it exists. It's called a PSAP there were supposed to not be allowed to make any medical claims. Now that didn't stop people, but the idea was these things could not say, oh, I can make you hear better, but I can improve your hearing for let's say bird watching or uh, environmental sounds or things like that. Nobody ever really followed that rule anyway, to be completely honest. 
so this is how hearing aids have been up until recently. Recently, a whole lot of changes. So now we've got over-the-counter hearing aids. And then even in traditional hearing aids, we have so many more options for how we go about getting hearing aids. The traditional brick and mortar, uh, is that a private practice? Is that an ENT clinic? That was where originally we you know, expected uh, patients to buy hearing aids, but then the internet became a thing and things like lively hearing became an option for patients. Big box stores, Costco and Sam's began offering products. Now, again, I'm not here to diss or advocate for any one of those service models. I'm just saying that these are um, you know, the options that are currently available. So how does one choose which way to go? So we've sat it for three years, scratching our heads. And then finally, on October 19th, 2021, big day in the industry, the FDA finally released its proposed guidelines for over-the-counter hearing aids. Now, it's currently in a 90-day review period. So pretty much anyone, um, people in the profession, people in the public, you can write in and comment um, on these rules, uh, but pretty much 90 days after, it's it not extremely likely that a whole lot is gonna change. So my favorite part of this uh, 114 page document, which I may or may not have accidentally printed on the work computer, not realizing it was so big and killed a rainforest. Um, but yes, very difficult read, but here are my takeaways. I think this is gonna be absolutely wonderful because I think it's going to be survival of the fittest. Any device now that says it's treating hearing loss is going to have to obtain this 510K FDA clearance. So what this means is that all of these devices out there that aren't great, okay, they're gonna have to actually do clinical studies that show that their devices actually work. And if they don't, then they're going to be put right back into the PSAP category. So uh, I, I think that this is uh, actually potentially a good thing. I think it's going to potentially lead to more transparent advertising and marketing if enforced, right? And that's the biggest thing. Are they going to enforce that new rule? The uh, guidelines also go into a lot of technical stuff about frequency range, output limits, distortion, blah, blah, blah. A lot of stuff that audiologists care about and we care a lot about, probably a little bit um, too sciencey and dorky for this topic though, or for this audience. Uh, and then design requirements. They want to make sure that any device that is an OTC device is constructed with materials that aren't gonna injure the patient. Maybe the speaker doesn't go too far into the ear canal or um, it's not, uh, it has to be a hypoallergenic material, things like that. Okay, so who are OTC hearing aids designed for? Persons with mild to moderate self-perceived hearing loss. And again, that word self-perceived is doing a lot of heavy lifting in that sentence. Uh, and these uh, patients have to be 18 years or older. Who are they not appropriate for? People with uh, traumatic deformities of the ear, active drainage in the last 90 days, a whole bunch of earwax or maybe a foreign body in the ear, any type of pain or discomfort, pretty much any type of dizziness, chronic or acute. Now, number six cracks me up, okay? Because the premise behind OTC hearing aids is that you do not need to have a hearing test. But one of these red flags is you have, you're not allowed to have an audiometric airbone gap equal to or greater than 15 decibels at 500, 1000 and 2000 Hertz. Now, if you haven't had a hearing test, how are you gonna know that? Hmm, that's a mystery. We'll go back to that one, but. Uh, seven, suddenly or uh, rapidly progressing hearing loss within the previous 90 days and unilateral hearing loss of sudden or recent onset within the last 90 days. I'm going to take a moment to be a little tangential here. If you or anyone you know 
experiences a sudden onset hearing loss, do not wait, do not pass go, go directly to an emergency room and get a referral to an ENT. If there is a true sudden loss, we have a very narrow window of time in which it can potentially be recovered, okay? So that's unrelated to this topic, but I think it's a very important thing for any person with hearing loss to be aware of. Okay, so what is the difference between these expensive prescription hearing aids and these more affordable OTC hearing aids? Well, a prescription hearing aid, you know, by the name is prescribed. A hearing test is used to prescribe the hearing aid. Over the counter, no test required. With the prescription hearing aid, uh, it's initially dispensed. We call this a hearing aid orientation. Follow-up care, routine maintenance, and repairs, all of these things are typically provided by the provider or, or performed rather uh, by the provider during the warranty of the hearing aid. Now, that being said, the service models um, between clinics varies greatly, okay? I have seen some practices that sell a hearing aid and they give you two or three follow-ups. I've seen others that give you follow-ups for the warranty of the hearing aid. I have seen others that give you free follow-ups for the life of the hearing aid. Um, so that can, that can vary dramatically. If you're interested in getting a prescription hearing aid, you know, do your due diligence there, find out um, those specifications. Are you going to be paying out of pocket for additional care at any point or is all of it bundled into the initial cost? Um, and so, oh, and then so for our kind of the other side of that, while with the prescription hearing aid, you get all of this hands-on care, the over-the-counter hearing aid is quite literally designed to have no involvement from a licensed provider. Uh, the service models um, vary greatly, blah, blah, blah. Prescription hearing aids are designed for everyone, from babies up into our you know, geriatric patients. To date, my oldest patient is 107. Isn't that, a, yes, we, awesome. we brought a cake for her, for uh, her appointment. We actually scheduled it on the birthday, but uh, yes. So we can treat, um, you know, any age. OTC hearing aids are really designed for people with, again, that bad word, perceived mild to moderate hearing losses. And it's really only supposed to be for ages 18 and above. Okay, now I've kind of alluded to this earlier, but of all the marketing that you guys have seen in the last three years about hearing aids, guess what? Not a single one of those OTC hearing aids is an OTC hearing aid, not a one of them, unless you've seen the Bose sound control hearing aid. Currently, Bose has the only FDA authorized OTC device. It is $895 a pair. Uh, you do take an online hearing screening, okay? It is rechargeable. And right now there's not Bluetooth, but this is the first generation. You know, I'm sure there's more to come. Bose is a reputable product. The thing that makes me the happiest about this product is last week I had a patient come in. In fact, I think the patient might be on this call, I think. Uh, I invited her, so I hope she showed up. Anyway, um, she said, you know, I went on to the Bose website and I took their hearing screening and it said, no, I was scoring in the severe range and I should go see an audiologist. That's amazing. If this is regulated by the FDA in a way where patients do get hearing screenings, and have a referral made if it exceeds that mild to moderate category? How is this a bad thing in any way? I, I just, I don't, I don't really see it. Anyway, so the only one that's on the market right now is um, the Bose Sound Control. I have not yet listened to it, but I have some audiology friends that have, and they say that it has really good fidelity. Okay, so my next question for you is, well, are over-the-counter hearing aids the solution, right? So the whole idea was let's make these hearing aids more affordable 
and get people to actually start using hearing aids more. And I'm in agreement. I don't think that the only people that should wear hearing aids are the ones that can afford them. That's why my favorite part of my job is uh, putting hearing aids on, you know, kids and folks through the foundation. Uh, but that being said, is just reducing the cost going to solve our problem? And I, so 20% of patients who could actually benefit from hearing aids actually wear them. So that, that's 80% of people walking around with hearing loss that could be treated with hearing aids that are cho they're choosing not to. So why is that? Is cost the only thing that's uh, preventing it? And I would argue no. Uh, some research has come out of uh, the European Union and over there hearing aids for the most part if the hearing loss is to a certain extent or um, you know severity, they get hearing aids for free. There's 55 million people over there with hearing loss, but guess what? Only one in six actually wears hearing aids. So if they're getting them for free and they're not wearing them, what the heck's going on? Why are people not doing well with hearing aids? Okay, so again, this leads to uh, my case studies. What determines whether or not a patient is going to be successful with hearing aid? Is it the instrument? You know, is it the widget? Is it the provider? Or is it a combination of both of those things? The most common reasons that I see patients fail with hearing aids, um, I've kind of broken it down into five things. Number one, the patient does not acknowledge hearing difficulty and they're not motivated to use hearing aids. Uh, two, they've waited too long to treat their hearing loss. This results in poor word understanding and auditory deprivation. Uh, maybe the hearing aid that they were dispensed isn't appropriate for their hearing loss. Luckily, I am happy to report that I've not seen that too often in my practice. Uh, most of the time it's that it's not maybe prescribed correctly, but I've not seen too many cases where a hearing aid was just completely flippantly out, um, out of bounds, you know, out of completely inappropriate for a loss. That gives me hope. Uh, so hearing aids are not prescribed appropriately. Now this number four, ding, ding, ding. This is, I think, where um, the magic is. Either people are given too much sound way too soon or verification is not used. And then lastly, maybe they weren't really ever taught how to use the hearing aids or they don't get follow-up care to maintain the hearing aids. A hearing aid that's full of wax is gonna be more like an earplug than an amplifier. Okay, so I wanna go and delve into each of these categories just a little bit more, okay? So the first one, the patient doesn't acknowledge that they have hearing difficulty and they're not motivated to wear them. Hearing aids have to be worn to be effective. Patients come into my office in denial all the time. If I have a patient sitting across from me and their spouse is the only reason that they are in my office and they tell me they are not going to wear their hearing aids a minimum of eight to 10 hours a day, I kindly suggest that they seek a different provider uh, because my patients do not fail with hearing aids. Okay, and the only way to succeed with hearing aids is to wear the hearing aids. I've actually, uh, I've done that on several occasions. Um, I don't want to waste my time and I don't wanna waste the patient's time either. And a lot of times, you know, I, I feel bad doing that because I see the spouse, I see their their child or their, their loved ones and their help my, help my you know, significant other hear better. But the fact remains that we can't be motivated enough for that other person. Um, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're gonna be right either way. And if this person is really not motivated to wear their hearing aids, the everything that they hear with that hearing aid is gonna be a problem, right? Uh, but I feel bad in those situations because as Dr. Mark Ross brilliantly said, 
when someone in the family has a hearing loss, the entire family has a hearing problem. So normally after I get a little um, bossy, <laughs> stern, stern with my patients, I am stern. Uh, usually I, I, I kind of pull the guilt trip on them and, and I'm able to motivate my patients quite well. So I don't have to turn people away often. It has happened, but not often. Usually I'm able to uh, make them see that their hearing loss isn't just affecting them. It's affecting everyone they communicate with. Okay. <clears throat> Another reason people fail with hearing aids is, well, you waited too long to treat it. You know, I think we know in every other aspect of our healthcare that the sooner we identify a problem and we treat it, the more treatable it is, right? That makes sense. Why, when it comes to hearing loss, do we want to kick the can down the road and say, man, how bad can I let this get before I'm actually going to do something about it? And I see this all the time. Uh, so let me uh, kind of show you this graph because the reason waiting too long to treat the hearing loss is critical is because frankly, we do not hear with our ears. We hear with our brain. Let me show you this graph here. So the X's and O's on this graph, um, in case and people aren't familiar with an audiogram, I would hope in this population, um, you've at least seen one at some point in your life, but this is called an audiogram and how you read this is top to bottom is volume. So very, very soft sounds are up here and very, very loud sounds are down here. And then from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, that's a frequency based to treble. So each of these X's and O's basically shows how loud, when we had you in the sound room, did we have to make these individual beeps, okay? So for this beep, we would make the beep louder, softer, louder, softer, find the point where you just barely push the button and that would be your threshold for that sound. Now this right ear, this is from somebody with a very, very mild hearing loss, okay? their word understanding ability is 100%. Look over, oh, look over at the left ear, right? This is not a mild hearing loss. Those X's and square boxes are way further down the graph. This hearing loss has been around way longer. And what happened? Their word understanding score is 76%. The word recognition score, I would argue, is the most important part of any hearing test. And the reason is our ear detects sound. That's all it does. It says, is there a sound? Is there not? It sends that signal to the brain, but the brain is where the magic happens. The brain is where sound turns back into meaningful language. And over time, the pathways that connect our ear to the brain quite literally begin to shrink. They begin to atrophy like a muscle would atrophy if you don't use it. The old adage, if you don't use it, you lose it is true. Um, and that's especially true when it comes to processing. And the longer somebody goes without sound, the harder it is to get the brain used to sound again. I've said for years to any patient that would listen, that I would rather put a 10 year old entry level hearing aid on somebody with a mild hearing loss than the Rolls Royce of hearing aids on somebody with a severe to profound loss that's never worn them. Um, you know, he who starts with the mildest prescription will win. Okay, number three. Uh, hearing device is not appropriate for the hearing loss. Okay, this does sometimes happen. And sometimes not always at the fault of the provider. Um, that little tiny, tiny baby hearing aid over there, every single patient walks into my office, wants that hearing aid, and I can't blame you. That's the cute little tiny baby hearing aid. Nobody can see that you're wearing it. The problem is that is really only for a very, very specific niche type of hearing loss that is way less common. Uh, most 
of the time, people come in with a standard, what we call presbycusis, which is a big fancy word for hearing loss that is a result of aging and noise exposure. Um, and most of the time they come in with that. And for that type of hearing loss, this little itty bitty in the canal hearing aid would sound God awful. It would sound like you were talking in the bottom of a well uh, because of something called the occlusion effect. And I can go into that at a later date. I could do an entire presentation on, on that. Uh, but so suffice it to say the type of hearing aid you want isn't always the type of hearing aid that's best for you. So it's probably in your best interest to follow the guidance of your hearing healthcare professional. Um, the other common thing that I see is patients come into my office with a device prescribed somewhere else, and maybe they have a low power speaker, but their hearing loss called for a medium power. Or maybe they have a high power speaker and it's a uh, it really, really only needs a medium power. So that's, those are the two kind of more common, um, more common things. All right, the, the most common thing is that hearing aids just aren't prescribed correctly. And I see this all the time, every day of my life. Either it's too much sound, way too soon, or the hearing aids just frankly aren't being prescribed or ver uh, they're, they're being prescribed, but that prescription is never verified. And I'm sorry, but can you hear me now is not verification that the hearing aid is working. Um, too much sound too soon is also another thing that causes hearing aids to end up in a drawer instead of an ear. Um, I like to use analogies. If any of my patients are on the call, I apologize if you're hearing this for the 1,000th time. Uh, but when I take somebody that's never worn a hearing aid, okay, and they have years and years of hearing loss, and I try to put a hearing aid on them at full prescription, meaning I'm giving them all the volume that they need to make speech clear, it's way too much. It puts the brain into auditory overload. It's like taking somebody from a dark room and throwing them into the blinding sun. Not very comfortable, right? The same is true for hearing, okay? What I like to use is I think of it as a dimmer switch approach, okay? At first, you need a little bit of light in the room. Maybe you light one candle, that's comfortable, okay? After a while, you're in this room with one candle lit and it starts to seem dark again. You need to light a couple more candles and then you can start seeing maybe a little bit more detail. You can see that there's artwork on the wall. There's an end table that now you're not gonna trip over. Um, you have to take baby steps. So when I dispense hearing aids, I use my, what I call my little dimmer switch approach and it, it's uh, worked pretty well for me over the years. I just find that too much, too soon, things are too sharp, things are too tinny, toilet sounds like Niagara Falls. It's my job to make people enjoy hearing again. Uh, and just too much all at once makes it not a pleasurable experience. And I don't want hearing to be an unpleasurable experience at any point for my patients. So I've been accused of holding my patients' hands a bit too much, but. Eh, what can you do? <laughs> All right, so why else do patients fail with hearing aids? Cleaning and maintenance, oh my goodness, this is huge. Every single time I get a repair, it's a wax guard. I'm telling you, 99% of the time, it's a wax guard. Change your wax guards. If you don't know what a wax guard is, talk to your audiologist, talk to your hearing instrument specialist, Talk to a younger sibling or child that has good vision, get them to help you out. Uh, the wax guard is there to prevent earwax from getting into the speaker of the hearing aid where the sound comes out. If that thing plugs up, the hearing aid is gonna be a, an ear plug. It's gonna do absolutely nothing. So a perfectly good, expensive, fancy hearing aid can sound like a dead hearing aid. Cleaning is key. Uh, in my clinic, I have designed, uh, I see my patients four times a year. I see them once usually for an initial consultation. 
uh, during an acclimatization period, I usually, if, if they decide to get hearing aids, I see them a week after, uh, two weeks after that. And then once I graduate them to full prescription, which we'll go into in just a moment here, once I graduate them, I'm still going to see these patients every four months. Okay. And there's a reason for this. Number one, I need to clean their hearing aids. There's only so much you guys can do at home. I've got a lot of fun tools. I've got needle vacuums. I've got a bunch of brushes and suction chambers. Uh, it's my job to make sure the hearing aids last for as long as we need them to. You know, they say the average life of a hearing aid is, is three to five years. And it's my goal to make sure they last every minute of that three to five years for you. And the best way to do that is routine cleaning and maintenance. Uh, also, hearing aids are computers. They are more sophisticated computer chips than your iPhone or your Android smartphone or your uh, computer that you're on right now. That little tiny computer chip, I would argue, is way more sophisticated, believe it or not. Um, and they need software updates. So every so often, I need to have you come into the office. I need to connect your hearing aids to the computer, and I need to install software updates. Back in the day, this wasn't a big deal, okay? But now, all hearing aids, for the most part, connect to Bluetooth. And for those of you with hearing aids, that should have been another poll question is how many of you love Bluetooth? Bluetooth is great for persons with hearing loss that have uh, hearing aids, but it is the biggest nightmare for people on this side of the table. I think I'm half audiologist, half uh, Apple technician some days, but anyway, that's a uh, neither here nor there. Uh, so firmware updates. I need to see my patients every four months because I need to make sure that their hearing aids are up to date. Also, I'm spying on you. I know exactly how many hours a day you're wearing hearing aids. And if you're not wearing them, oh boy, I am so good at getting on a guilting soapbox. I mean, it's it's a skill set of mine to be to, to be completely honest. Uh, I really I think that truly the guilt, I think that's why my patients, I don't I don't think I'm really good at my job. I think it's <laughs> it's it's the guilt that makes my patients wear the hearing aids. Um, an annual hearing test. Okay, this is huge for me. All right, first off, I love the idea of OTC hearing aids for mild to moderate losses. I think you've all gained uh, that bit of knowledge. But please get a hearing test. The, the whole thing is, oh, you don't need a hearing test. You don't need, an, just get a hearing test. There are a million places, even on the websites, or on the internet, you can get a hearing screening. Medicare covers one hearing test a year, get a hearing test, have a decent baseline to start with. It would make your life so much better and the hearing aid works so much, so much more uh, uh, successfully. Uh, annual retest, so it, at least get one test, okay? Do, if you do one thing, get one test for me. My patients, like clockwork, get annual hearing tests. And it's crazy to me that somebody can get a hearing aid five years ago. And then I say, okay, when's your last hearing test? Oh, it was five years ago. Have you been wearing the same glasses for the last five years? Or do you occasionally go in and get your glasses, your, you know, prescription checked? Oh, okay. Maybe now I'm seeing the, the book and, you know, the words clear. So yes, my patients like clockwork every year, annual hearing test. It's critical. Um, how am I doing on time? I can be a little bit chatty. You're good. Keep going. Okay. Okay. Uh, so yes. So that leads me to how hearing aids are actually prescribed. We have really fancy softwares. I'm not going to lie to you. There's not a whole lot that goes into programming a hearing aid in a software. Okay. We type in a hearing test like the one on the graph. Our software goes and it says, okay, here's exactly how much volume you need for here, 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 here. Granted, you know, there's a science and an art to fitting hearing aids. Some patients don't want as much volume as others. Some want to hear everything. They want to hear the blades of grass. So, you know, it's a science and an art, but the software makes a huge assumption. Okay, it makes the assumption using this little guy. This guy's name is Kimar. He's what we use in a lot of acoustical research. 
his little thing in here is called a Swislowski coupler. It's exactly two cc's in size. So it's exactly the same size as the average ear canal. So when we do, and we're creating, we're, we're creating all of these prescriptions, he's how we're doing it. So the problem is not everybody has a two cc ear canal, right? The human ear is as unique as a fingerprint. Fun audiology fact, did you know that in the old days, mug shots were taken from the front and from the side because fingerprints had not yet been discovered and the most anatomically recognizable part of the body was the curves of the ear. Isn't that interesting? I think so. <laughs> I'm full of uh, useless uh, audiology facts, but I make a really good partner in um, trivia. <laughs> Okay, so basically sound changes in the space that it's in. If I'm speaking to you in a small room versus an auditorium, well, yeah, my voice is gonna sound a lot different. So how does this affect it? Well, if I assume that somebody has a two cc ear, but their ear canal is actually a lot bigger than that, chances are I'm not giving them enough volume. I'm under amplifying them. And if somebody has an itty bitty small ear canal, and I'm assuming that their ear canal is larger, I'm probably over amplifying them. And if I do not do real ear verification, I have no idea. Which leads me to what the heck is real ear verification? Real ear verification is the gold standard. This is best practice uh, in how to perform dispensing audiology. So we know that not every ear is different. We know that every ear is like a fingerprint. How can we make sure that that hearing aid is doing in that patient's ear what we think it's doing? And the answer is we measure it. So we take this little tiny microphone, okay? This little thing here is a microphone and we put it right next to the eardrum. I'm talking right next to the eardrum. And then we put the hearing aid in and we measure what the hearing aid is doing inside the patient's ear. So we know exactly if we're meeting their prescription. Okay, so this is where the lovely Dr. Sharon Rende may have to assist. This is where it gets a little uh, technical. So if uh, anybody doesn't understand, like give me a hand raise or something and we'll tag in uh, my humble assistant. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <clears throat> the last graph that I showed you, it went soft up top to loud at the bottom. Now, just to confuse you, I flipped this over, okay? So now soft is on the bottom and then it gets louder as we go to the top. This is the screen that I see after I do real ear verification. Okay, so I've got a person hooked up. I've got a microphone in their ear and I am measuring what that hearing aid is doing in the ear canal. This red line at the bottom is where they just start to hear. This white area is where I want them to be. The idea is I want these little squiggly lines to be right in that middle section. And what I'm doing to get these squiggly lines is I have the patient seated with these microphones and about one meter away, I have a speaker that is uh, calibrated. They hear what's called the rainbow passage. The rainbow passage is a passage that was designed by a lot of really smart people a lot of years ago that took time and they tried to figure out how often each sound in the English language occurred, like how many S's, how many F's, how many TH's how often they occurred in conversational English, right? So they spent all this time doing this and then they put together a rainbow passage, which accurately um, kind of shows, it accurately represents a normal conversation. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, so we have the patient sitting there, we listen to the rainbow passage and then the squiggly lines in the center are what the hearing aid is doing. Everybody following so far? Yeah? Okay. 
again, I really feel like I got to say this. This is in no way a review of any specific product or delivery method. My only question is, if a device is being dispensed, why are we dispensing it? And how do we know that it's doing what we want it to do and actually helping the patient? At the end of the day, that is the most important thing. So case study one. This is a 45, or sorry, 41 year old patient. He had resound hearing aids that he had gotten from a local Costco. Uh, huge news on that front actually, until last year, if you had purchased a hearing aid from a Costco, I could not program it. As a private audiologist, I would be locked out of that hearing aid and uh, I couldn't program it. Just recently, people come in and I can actually tinker with them. So it, it, that's been an exciting thing. Uh, okay, so 41 year old patient, he has hearing aids dispensed from a local Costco, but he just, he doesn't feel like they're helping him con hear conversation. He just thinks that they amplify noise. Um, he's had hearing loss for 15 years and he's actually owned a hearing aid for, or hearing aids for about 10 years, but he was honest with me and said he never really uh, consistently wore them. So I bring him in, we get them all hooked up and the little bottom green line there, that is what his hearing aid was doing as he had it programmed when he came in. Okay. So if I want this little green squiggly line to be in this white shaded area to be in prescription, what this graph is telling me is that he is massively under prescription, like massively. So I made some adjustments. I brought the hearing aid up. Oh my goodness, he's in prescription. He's hearing better. I just made his day and um, he tells me that I, I may have saved his marriage also. So there you go. Not all in a day's work for an audiologist. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> case study two. I, this is a 92 year old patient. She had purchased um, top of the line Phonak hearing aids, Phonak, one of the big six companies uh, with a provider out of state the provider was an audiologist. She was a, a very reputable um, audiologist. Uh, and the patient had worn hearing aids for like two decades or something. She was a long-term user, uh, but she came down and she was telling me, you know, I got these hearing aids, but they are just way too tinny and way too shrill. And as it turns out, verification, real ear verification had not been performed. So again, the green line is where the hearing aids were when she came in, okay? So what are we seeing here? We're seeing her green line is way over the white. And not only that, it's way over the white in the treble side of the graph. Well, no wonder she thinks it's tinny and shrill as she's being massively overamplified in the high pitches. So I tinkered with the programming. We got her into her actual prescriptive targets and she was a happy camper. And, um, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it's always really nice to, to help people out when they're in that situation. Okay, case study three, 88 year old patient. Now he was um, a very special patient, kind of a, a family friend type of situation, if you know what I mean. He has a history of dementia. Uh, family had tried to get him hearing aids once before. Family is on a fixed income. Uh, he's already lost one set of hearing aids. They paid the $300 per ear replacement deductible, and then he lost those. So in desperation, his son went out and he bought these things called Olive Pro. They look like Apple Eye. Um, iPods? I, I, is it iPod? I don't know. You can earbuds. tell. Ear, earbuds? Oh, man. I, you can tell earbuds. that I'm like not a millennial <laughs> by the fact that I don't know all these earbuds. new hip terms. Whatever. They look like those things that the kids earbuds. use, right? Uh, and this makes it easier for the son because the son can now see if his dad's wearing them very readily, right? And they control, you know, via an app. Um, you know, and so I said, okay, well, you invested money in this. 
I couldn't blame them for not wanting to get another set of hearing aids after, you know, we had two losses within the first year. Uh, so we, you know, hook them up, see what happens. And the bottom green curve is, uh, is where the hearing aid or yeah, the, well, I guess it's not technically a hearing aid anymore. Uh, the earbuds, the PSAP, it was, you know, not actually terrible. Really, it wasn't. Um, and I made a little bit of changes just using the app because they're Bluetooth to the phone. I just made a few changes in the app and I was actually, I was surprised. I was able to get a pretty decent um, response there. I'm still a little bit under target in these lows. Um, oh, that's another thing that I will mention. That's the difference between um, an OTC device and a prescription hearing aid. Do you see how peaky this response is? See how it's all kind of like jagged, okay? A prescription hearing aid, you notice how much more smooth the response is. That's another difference. Um, and sound quality wise for patients, that actually makes a huge difference. Um, again, not saying OTC hearing aids are a bad thing. Um, just saying that, you know, acoustically, uh, for those acoustic nerds in the audience, um, there is a huge difference there. Okay. Now, if any of my patients or hopefully some of my students got to jump on here uh, to watch this, um, I love analogies. So what do you think, which guitar what rather do you think sounds better? This 1956 Gibson Hummingbird valued at, oh, just under 11 grand, or this more economical Rogue RA $9470. I should have made this a poll question. Mm, retrospect. Okay, well, I would argue that most of you are going to say the fancy schmancy hummingbird, right? Am I right? Can I, <laughs> can I get a yes? Yes? Okay. Well, now, what if I told you that the person playing that guitar, the fancy hummingbird, is that cute little dude, Abel, who is my nephew? I can assure you guys he has had no formal musical training. Uh, and the more economical guitar is being played by one Eric Clapton. Now, which guitar do you think sounds better? Yeah. So hopefully you agree with me and you're going to say that the uh, Eric Clapton and the economical guitar is definitely going to be uh, better than poor little Abel. Bless his heart. He's trying though. <laughs> he's still in lessons. He's getting better. I don't have to leave the room now if he tries to practice. So, um, but yeah, so exactly. The, we know that the quality of the sound that we're going to hear from that guitar is way more related to who's playing that guitar and less the guitar itself. And I feel this way about hearing aids and prescribed hearing aids and over-the-counter hearing aids. This is genuinely how I feel. Um, I think the quality of the hearing aid fitting is really based on the quality of uh, the standard of care and, and is verification used? Are we making sure that uh, we're actually helping the patient, right? If the patient comes in and they're not doing well, guess what? There's probably a reason. We've got to figure out what that reason is. Sometimes it's an issue of realistic expectations, but a lot of other times there are ways that we can do our jobs better if we just think a little creatively and out of the box, yeah. So both musical instruments and hearing instruments are going to perform better in the hands of an experienced professional. Okay, so what's the takeaway? What's the end goal? I think the end goal for everyone on this talk is we want to improve hearing, right? That's what we're here for. Any device regardless of technology, is going to function best in the hands of a professional following best practice standards, that being the key word, okay? Not all professionals are created equal in any field I've ever met in my entire life, and the hearing healthcare industry is no different. Um, I like to think of over-the-counter hearing aids as the training wheels of hearing aids. <laughs> what the heck do I mean by that? Well, Okay, so let's say that let's say that the FDA does really regulate it, okay, and they regulate it, and 
the manufacturers of these devices step up and they say, man, we're going to do what Bose is doing. We're going to offer this online screening and we are going to be honest. And if a patient is scoring above that mild to moderate region, we are going to make the appropriate referral. If that happens, oh my God, best day of my life. Um, because what's going to happen then? The people that are in the mild to moderate range are going to treat their hearing loss earlier, okay? And what's gonna happen? They're gonna retain auditory processing. So maybe by the time their hearing loss inevitably progresses, because guess what guys, the number one or the most common type of hearing loss is a sensory neural hearing loss. And that is a permanent loss, it is a progressive loss. If I can get people treating their hearing loss at a mild stage, the brain never goes without that critical sound. The brain doesn't lose the processing. It makes the, it makes the, uh, the outcomes for that patient when they eventually do need a prescribed hearing aid, when they get beyond that mild to moderate range, it's gonna make them more successful users. So what's the downside? I don't see the downside. Maybe I'm optimistic or I don't, I don't know. Um, I don't see the downside, but change on the horizon. I think probably you guys have been reading a little bit about this. I'm going to be completely honest. I don't know everything about this. I've been going through, um, been going into a bit of a rabbit hole doing research for this talk. This is going to be my next rabbit hole that I look into, but it looks like there may be some changes coming. It looks like maybe there's going to be Medicare insurance coverage for hearing aids. And it looks like maybe there are going to be billable codes, right? So if you come in for a hearing aid appointment, I submit a bill to your insurance saying, hey, here's the appointment I did. Your insurance reimburses me. That's why hearing aids cost so much money, right? Because most people have bundled pricing. You pay up front for every service you're going to get for the life of the hearing aid. Imagine if Medicare picked up the cost of those follow-up appointments and we didn't have to bundle all of that in front. Am I talking about like a utopia? I can't wait for this to happen. I, I mean, I think this is going to be fantastic, but we'll see how it plays out. I don't know yet, um, but maybe if you guys enjoyed this talk in a couple of months when we mo know a little bit more, you'll invite me back um, uh, to talk about this. Uh, all right, so there is change on the horizon, but I do have to put this, this caution in because I've seen a lot of my patients get burned. Some private insurance companies do currently offer benefits, okay? Benefits. Do perform your own due diligence, okay? Not all insurance plans are created equal, and a lot of insurance agents are just trying to get you to sign stuff, okay? I think we all know that. Just last week, somebody tried to get my dad to leave his amazing PPO health plan to go to a crappy HMO plan because it was gonna save him $100 a year. And my dad almost fell for it, okay? And a lot of this stuff is out there and I treat my patients like they're my family. I think of my dad every time. So <laughs> just be careful, guys. Um, so do, do look at the insurance plan, make sure you know what it is, because there are different things. There are actual hearing aid benefits, okay, where you can choose which provider you want to go to. They do not have to be within any specific network, okay? You can go to a, any provider, you can submit that claim to your insurance, and then you will um, get your uh, reimbursement, right? But then they have these things called discount plans where you can sign up and you have to go to a certain office. That office is going to say, okay, well, here is your discounted hearing aids. Guys, I've been in this industry like 15 years. These discount plans, I will tell you, sometimes these discount plans are more expensive than I would charge you as just a private pay patient. So just really be careful there too. Um, third party payers is another thing. Now this, there are some practices um, that accept third party payers. What I will say is that a lot of, are you guys familiar with what a third party payer is? Can I get some like nods or let me see. Is there a consensus? Do we, do we know what a third party payer is? No, yes. 
No? Okay. So a third party payer, your insurance company hires like another, another company. Let's use, um, I don't want to use a specific, well, okay. Let's just say it's Amplifon. That's one of them. Amplifon then hires audiologists or hearing instrument specialists to be a part of their Amplifon group. So if you have such and such ABC insurance and they have Amplifon doing their hearing aids, you have to go to a provider that is in this Amplifon network, okay? You, depending on, depending on the level of insurance, sometimes you get a discount. Sometimes you are entitled to free hearing aids. The provider is paid a very minimal fee. OK, a very, very small fee to do the dispense of the hearing aid or no, to do a hearing test and the dispense of the hearing aid and then maybe one or two follow up appointments. OK, and then any appointments after that, you're going to have to incur private um, you know, pay. That is actually not a bad thing. The problem is a lot of audiologists do not do this because it's difficult with how low the reimbursement is and how small these um, professional fees are to kind of keep the lights on. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty difficult thing to try to keep an entire dispensing practice open, have an assistant, have somebody answer the phones, uh, you know, put food on the table, if you're only making like a hundred dollars and you're spending seven hours with a patient, you know what I mean? Think about that. Break that down a hundred dollars over seven hours. That's, you know, that's not that great of income for anyone. Um, and these, the, the, so the third party payer thing, it's also access to follow-up care. A lot of people are like, okay, got your hearing aid, wham, bam, you're out the door. See you later. Call me if you need me, never call me. So you're going to, there are, there are, differences in, in quality of care in every venue, right? Every Costco, every private practice ENT, every um, private practice, every big box store, they're, they're, we're not all created equal, okay? So when and if you choose to treat your hearing loss, for those of you on the call, um, you know, do your due diligence. Make sure that uh, Real ear. Definitely make sure that whoever you see does real ear verification. That's critical. Okay. I think that's it. Did I skip a slide? No, that was it. All right. Hopefully I haven't chatted your ears off. Do you have any questions for me? Yes. Uh, this is Debbie. Um, please um, stop your share. And that way we can see everybody. Got it. Okay. Anybody has any questions? Has yeah, any I questions? Do. Can raise their hand or they can use the raise hand button. I see Tony has a, raised his hand. So I'm going to remove myself uh, at spotlight and look for Tony. Uh, oh boy. Uh, Tony, be, bear see. with me. Where are you, Tony? Okay, there I see you. Okay, add you to the spotlight so we can see you. Go ahead, Tony. Okay, uh, thank you, Lynette, for the uh, excellent presentation. Can you, you. Can you uh, explain what the, uh, the maximum decibel is from a traditional hearing aid and what the OTC guideline is saying? And mm -hmm. also, the other question, can I pretty much assume that if I have a custom mold that I would not be a candidate for an OTC? Let's break that up into two parts. <laughs> the first one, um, well, actually, let me answer the second one first and then we'll go back. Just because you have a custom mold doesn't necessarily mean that you're not a candidate, okay? There are a lot of different reasons that I would put a custom mold on a patient. Maybe they have a hearing loss, but it's only low pitch. I need a custom mold to trap low pitch energy in the ear canal. Uh, maybe they just got a really tiny or curvy ear canal and I can't get a speaker to go in there because their ear is so cattywampus, I've got to take an impression. So I guess it uh, is it that they had to create a mold to give you more power? 
In that case, I would say, yeah, you're probably not a candidate. Um, or was it one of those other reasons? I would look at your hearing test. Um, and, and if you're not sure what it means, I'll give you my email address, shoot me an email, let's send it in an attachment and I'll, um, I'll go over it with you. Are we allowed to do that? Can you send it to me in an attachment or is that a HIPAA violation? If he's sending it, he's sharing your information, that's okay. Okay, all right, so apparently that's okay. And then the uh, decibel, oh, what was the first? What was the first part? The, the decibel oh, output. Oh, okay. Like traditional oh. and OPC. Sure. Um, so the so we that's all the nerdy stuff. Are you an engineer? Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> I love you guys. Oh, oh, you speak my language. Okay. So um, right now the limits for the OTC is 115 decibel max output with out some type of adaptive gain control, right? So if the device has some type of a volume control, then they'll allow it to go to 120. If it does not, they'll, they cap it at 115. It does seem like a lot. It does seem like a lot. And it makes me a bit nervous, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. For a moderate loss. For a moderate, yeah, I know. That, that does make me a bit nervous. I read that too. Um, um, frequency range they're saying is going to be anywhere from about 250 to 5,000 Hertz. Now that does not mean that every OTC that comes on the market is going to have that. Um, but I, that's kind of, um, I think going to be one of the things, God, how excited am I that all of these garbage products, because there are some really good PSAPs on the market right now. If those PSAPs actually put the money in, to conduct trials and to conduct research to say, hey, my stuff does work and we can vet out all the garbage and have like a really good subset of OTCs. I think that would be awesome. Um, and the other hearing aids traditional, the difference between the OTC. Oh, test. oh, and then, oh, thank you. I go off on tangents, my apologies. Uh, so the, uh, the traditional hearing aids, oh, I have control of that, my friend. That is, um, based on the receiver. A couple of slides in, I had a picture of a really tiny, tiny baby hearing aid. That hearing aid is gonna have probably a, like a low gain receiver just because it's so small and the size of a receiver uh, dictates, you know, how loud we can make it, right? Um, a more powerful receiver, I can get up to 132 decibels. Now, if I were going with like an over the ear BTE, I think the loudest one I've seen, I think the loudest one on the market right now goes up to 142 decibels. Now that's for somebody who is like needs a cochlear implant, but can't have surgery. Like nobody needs that amount that could cause hearing loss in a quick hurry in somebody that puts that on and does not need it. Okay. Did I finally did I finally answer your question? You finally got it. Thank oh. you, your uh, your assistant over there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wish you would get on the screen with me. Um, uh, let me see if I can find Stan, and then yep. spotlight you. Can you okay. hear me? I'm going to spotlight you now. Go ahead, Stan. Ask your question. Can you? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. We can hear you. Yeah. Lynette, uh, you're fabulous. I mean, you really uh, explained <laughs> you. a lot is. of this Aww. stuff. But I have, a, I have a question. It's really about the business practices of audiologists, just the way it's practiced here in the United States. Sure. Um, you were saying, I mean, there seems to be no reason now that uh, all of this stuff has to be bundled. I mean, audiologists could charge separately for fitting hearing test, uh, repairs, cleaning. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any, any reason that it can't be, it can be uh, unbundled even before you have third party Medicare, which from, from the way the politics look, it's gonna be far off. Yeah, so yeah. I'm, I'm just saying, because I was giving a presentation to the group and uh, I got mine through a government program where instead of $7,000, the government cost was 824 just for the instrument. So nice. all the other stuff is, you know, profit cleaning, rent, all the other stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And, and my, my 
feeling is that if the audiologist did unbundle even before Medicare comes along, the increase in volume of people who would flock to the offices, especially yours, <laughs> uh, would would overcome any any loss of advantage that you have with bundling. Yes, I absolutely agree. Let me tell you a little story about that. <laughs> okay. The, the last practice, um, or no, the first practice that I worked at right out of grad school was in, in Gainesville. And we developed an unbundled pricing structure. It was awesome. I loved it. It was amazing. And we would offer different types of un unbundling. We would do like a la carte, where if you want a clean and check versus you want this or you want that, um, we would also offer like service plans, like gold, silver, platinum. Um, it was really great, but I found that most patients were buying the platinum plan to come see me every four months. Like I like them to come see me. And when we worked the numbers, it actually ended up being cheaper to pay it up front than in the long term. So we, I did it both ways. And I, I love Unbundled. I do. When I came to the Institute two and a half, three years ago now, um, one of my roles here was to develop a dispensing practice. Prior to this, the Institute itself did not um, did not just uh under the institute didn't dispense uh so kind of i got that up and running um here at this um, practice and I, we have discussed dr rende my boss and i have discussed moving to an unbundled uh sector but at being an early an early business or i don't want to say early but a, a new business young thank you see this is why she comes she's like my uh interpreter <laughs> Uh, so being such a young business and uh, being that my boss um, has been doing cochlear implants for, you know, like 35 years, something, I don't know, like a long time, she's not really worked with hearing aids. Uh, so it was easier for us to kind of join a buying group. And in doing so, that it, I don't know how technical I can get in this, but um, it, the way that we purchase hearing aids makes it a little bit necessary for us to charge on the front end. If we were to restructure, which is absolutely in the realm of uh, possibility, especially with all of these changes, um, um, yeah, I, I would be absolutely stoked. I'll chime in. I think that we um, keep looking at this and reassessing it. My one concern is when you unbundle my fear is the patient will buy the device and not come back for those routine services. If they feel that they have to pay every time to come in to get their hearing aid checked or cleaned or serviced or come in for a problem and they know I'm going to charge, I don't know, throw another fee, $100 a visit, then they may be less likely to maintain that device and to come back for those services. Um, and I think especially in healthcare now, I mean, we have patients even from the healthcare perspective that sometimes don't want to come back because they don't want to pay that copay every time. Um, so I think that's one thing that I've kind of looked at is, you know, is it better to pay it up front and let them know they can come in as frequently and as much as they need to, to have the services and not feel like they're being charged every time for every little thing they come in for. And I think our seniors see that and lived on fixed incomes and Medicare and they're having co-pays with all of it. So we do kind of look at it in both ways. And when we were starting out, it was an, a more seamless way for us to get everything going, but we are starting to relook, and especially with over-the-counter, how can we provide that and how can we, I'm sorry, our cleaning people just started. So you hear a vacuum in the background. We'll see if we can Hi, get it. Sorry. Can you can, uh, we're doing a presentation um, in here. Can can you oh, wait yeah. to vacuum? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. So um, I think that we are with the over-the-counter now going to look at 
can we offer both? Can we give the patient an option to bundle and a patient an option for a service contractor look at it um, in a different way? And especially because we do have a lot of snowbirds um, and patients that aren't with us 12 months out of the year. So I think it's, it's um, something that always needs to be re-looked re, re at, revisited. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I come down to Sarasota, so it, it wouldn't be hard for me to come over there. But, but um, what's interesting is um, this discussion that you just had. And, and there are, there, there are uh, things that are, are beneficial on both sides. Right. The question is, somebody's going to have to do it to run a real world experiment, because right now we just have predominantly the bundled model. And, you know, I think would be different, but you bring up some very good, very good points about people. Mm -hmm. Oh, I lost your audio. We lost Stan. your audio. I'm sorry. I, I accidentally, okay. accidentally muted him. I'm sorry. That's okay. Okay. Uh, but but uh, I can see that they're really both sides, and and really it's a question of somebody's going to have to bite the bullet and do the do the do the work and see what really happens. And and but a single practitioner or a single group of practitioners or a single chain, I don't think is really enough to 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 do that kind of experiment. I don't know. I'm working with. Dr. Lynn, Frank Lynn at, at uh, oh, Hopkins. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And, and of course, you know, I've told him about the, the military program and how it works and everything. And so we're, I don't know, we're, we're trying to get Hopkins to get into the military program, but the military is, uh, they're very hard to deal with. <laughs> yes. I trained it at, uh, at VA. I, I was oh, okay. a pre-doctoral fellow at VA. So uh, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm actually a huge fan of VA. They paid for my doctorate. So, uh, but uh, yeah. wow, congratulations on working well, with Frank Lynn. This that's is, it, that's this amazing. Is, you know, there's a difference between the VA system and the this RACHAP system, which is a, a regular military audiology clinic. So we have to pay actually for the instrument, but they take care of all the other services. Oh, the, cool. The molding and, you know, the repairs and the cleaning and all of that. So, but the, at the VA, I don't qualify, but if at the VA, uh, then it's all taken care of. So gotcha. it's a little bit different program. Oh, okay. Okay. All right, we, Thank um, you. Um, we do You're have welcome. another question. I'm going to remove the spotlight and add her and go ahead and ask your question. Uh, you're still muted. You're still muted. Unmute yourself. I thought I did. There we go. <laughs> now you're. Uh, I have severe hearing. Severe hearing loss. I've been wearing hearing aids wearing since I was year fifty, but I probably should have started getting them at forty. Um, and each time they, you know, they're getting worse and worse and worse and worse. My question is with the over-the-counter hearing aids. Um, do they have all those programs where you adapt to music, you adapt to, no. No, it, it's, it's going to have less sophisticated digital signal processing. What I mean by that is what changes the price of a hearing aid isn't really what it looks like, right? It's the computer chip inside. Is that computer chip a very basic computer chip or is it a very smart computer chip? A very basic computer chip doesn't do very well in noise. It's not smart enough to say, okay, that's speech, that's noise. I want to enhance the speech and suppress the noise, okay? The better the hearing aid, the better it's able to do that. When you start getting into these really high end, fancy schmancy hearing aids, that's when they're able to really categorize what's going on. That speech, that's noise, but I know exactly what type of noise that is. That's a blender running, or that's the car noise, or, oh, that's music in the background. I know that's music, and I know that the, for this person wants to hear music in a natural way. I'm not gonna monkey with the music part. I want that to be a nice, clear representation. 
oh, but you know, here's a dish is clanging. The more sophisticated the hearing aid, the more it's going to be able to manipulate the sound to optimize that sound before it gets into the ear. Because the fact remains, if you're wearing a hearing aid, you have some type of distortion to your hearing loss, right? Even a crystal clear signal in a distorted ear is not going to be a crystal clear signal once it gets here. So I can do um, as much as I possibly can to clean a signal up in a hearing aid, but if the brain has lost its ability to do its job, we're out of luck. You know, did I answer your I feel like brain. Yeah. Oh, and as a, with a severe hearing loss, you would not be a candidate for an over the counter device. Yeah, I didn't think I didn't think so, but I got a little concerned. Um, I have wide X, it's five years old, so I'm going to a new hearing aid. You have to try it out. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to resound. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you mentioned that resound was sent by is sold by Costco and uh, my audiologist is recommending ReSound. I'm getting a little like- No, don't uh, worry. Don't worry about that. ReSound uh, is a good, yeah, no, ReSound is a good hearing aid. Remember that, why can't, I'm trying to tell Tony Farrick that yes, absolutely, he can email me later, but my chat is not working for some reason. So um, yeah, don't worry about that. As long as you're within the big six hearing aid manufacturers, you know that you're getting a tried and true product. How well that hearing aid is going to work has nothing to do with the hearing aid. It has everything to do with the provider you're working with. A really good hearing aid in the hands of somebody that doesn't know what the heck they're doing with it is going to be a garbage hearing aid. A basic hearing aid, I can make sound pretty darn good if I need to, you know? And I, I like to think that, you know, Costco is an avenue for people and you can get top of the line hearing aids for um, a lot less than I can buy hearing aids for. I'm not going to lie. You can buy hearing aids at Costco for less than I can buy hearing aids from the company's our, our for, price, like our costs. It's yeah. ridiculous. And it's why a lot of audiologists are so ticked off at big box stores. But you know what, the way I see it, there's so many people with hearing loss, only 20% of them treat. I'm not trying to compete. If somebody is getting some type of hearing treatment, we're all in this together, you know? We're all in this together. Um, uh, we, we I don't do, know, I went we on a tangent. One more question from Libby. I want to go to her. Uh, so, and that will be uh, almost the last question. Okay. Go ahead, Libby. Okay. Well. Um, I have moderate to severe hearing loss, and I know OTC aids or whatever they are, um, are really for mild to moderate. Mm -hmm. But before the pandemic, I used to travel a lot. And this is my first set of hearing aids, so I don't have an extra set. Mm -hmm. okay. But one of your concerns or my concerns is when I travel, you know, it's always good to, to be prepared in case you lose something. Mm -hmm. so I thought when I started reading about these, oh, this might be a good idea to have something like this, just in case I'm uh, in Africa and, <laughs> and lose my hearing aids. And would something like this even work? Would I even be able to hear with it? Would it be better than no hearing aids? Um, so I guess, the, I mean, I, another option is I thought, well, I can, you know, for $1,500, I can get a, a pair at Costco. Uh, but of course, I mean, I'd never want to wear these because it would confuse my brain. Mm -hmm. Well, but, you know, you know, something, something's better than nothing. I would say, um, I would argue, or I would say that if you do get something over the counter, uh, find a provider in your area that does real ear verification and ask them if they would be willing to take a little bit of time to yeah. do real ear on the device and see if it's actually helpful. Um, not a lot of people will do that. I'm going to be completely honest. Yeah. I think I may be the only one. 
And I think, well, well, actually, <laughs> yeah. and, a, and, a back, and a backup at Costco is fine. But again, one of the problems is Costco doesn't really do real ear. So either way, yeah. you would have to, I would recommend seeing now that Costco hearing aids can be programmed by somewhere else. It's yeah. been about better. Well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that about a year from now, I'll be due for another pair of hearing aids. And then I'll have these as a backup. Yes. But and the it's only... The only thing, and maybe this is question B, um, I, uh, it's my understanding that even hearing aids uh, are in short supply now because- Oh of my God, you are, oh, yeah. The chips to make hearing aids. I used to be able to see a patient, order a hearing aid and get it two days, three weeks four weeks. If I want to get a custom hearing aid, I'm waiting six weeks for a custom hearing aid. Yeah. It's no bueno. <laughs> it's been a nightmare and I've got a lot of ticked off patients and I can't do anything about yeah. it. Oh, it's so frustrating. And it's not only that they're ticked off, I feel terrible because I've got patients that have they're going without hearing. And there's, I, I have literally every demo trial hearing aid that I've ever had in my clinic is currently on a patient right now to give them something while their stuff yeah. sits out in repair. It's because when we get in donations and, you know, patients will donate hearing aids or family right. members will donate and we try to, you know, refurbish them and keep them in stock. And we really have nothing left. I mean, just, we try to fit something on. So you have something while we're waiting. Right. Um, or if we have a cochlear implant patient and they're demoing a hearing aid and we're trying to give them sound on the other side, um, we're doing that. And we're, we have to make sure that we keep a couple in the clinic to actually do testing or troubleshooting with, because we're yeah. just giving them all out because we can't get parts. Yeah. Yeah. So what you're saying really is that OTC, this might be one possibility if this situation doesn't clear up to have just a well, OTC parts are going to be manufactured by the same. same people that are making the hearing aid parts. So is there only one manufacturer that makes the main chip. Mm -mm. I don't know. Oh, I've never heard there that are one microphone, the microphones. One no, they all use different microphones. Like Starkey uses the MEMS mic. And, no. um, this Sorry. is uh, Debbie Hagner. I have one quick question. Um, basically, what I'm concerned about is, okay, you got this over-the-counter hearing aid for those who have mild to moderate hearing loss. Great. What happens if it breaks? Then what are they going to do with it? Mm-hmm. Well, well I take the thing, too. Yeah. Do you guys all send it back to the company. Because, company. You know, if this over-the-counter hearing aid is going to be a mail-order thing, and that's mm -hmm. through you through online mail ordering, what is it, what's going to happen if they broke it or drop it or, or fell in the toilet or, or, or the dog shoot on it? What's going to happen to all those over-the-counter hearing aids? I think, and when I've kind of stalked a few OTC websites um, and prep for this talk, it looks like they have like accessories that you can purchase. Uh, like if your puppy chews up your receiver, you can go in and like, click and choose which receiver you want and they'll mail it to you um, because the hearing aids are modular now, right? So I can, let's say like Rick hearing aids, right? The ones that go behind the ear and it's not all a tube, it's actually a wire. These are modular. These are, these are great hearing aids because you can grow into them. Maybe you start out with a mild loss. I only need a low power speaker. God forbid, but inevitably the hearing loss worsens it progresses all i have to do is unplug one speaker and plug in a more powerful speaker and ta-da now i've got a more powerful hearing aid um the problem is you know people are not uh skilled at i can disassemble a hearing aid like a master mechanic can disassemble an engine um i don't know that that same thing could be done by the average Joe in house, you know, so I, I don't know. I don't know. That is a challenge. That is a challenge. And I think as service providers, we're going to have to figure out how to handle that challenge. You know, like we have people that walk in the office all the time um, and they come from other practices. And for the most part, we service them as a courtesy. 
um, even though they might not be our patient. Um, a lot of times we will, and <laughs> it kind of depends on the day and the, and and if we have the parts. Um, but I think we're going to have to really look at this from providing a service. You know, what do we charge? Do we charge an office visit? What? How do we charge for the parts? Do we even have the parts? I mean, if it's an over-the-counter that's private manufactured, private made, we may not even have access to the parts. So I think this over-the-counter is going to change a lot of service models for a lot of us. Mm -hmm. And that's where we were talking of bundling, unbundling, having different service plans and options available. So I think there are a lot of unknowns that are going to happen with with the OTCs, you know, that okay, we're going to want to address. Myself and we're going to take one last question. And my God, you guys were fabulous. Um, oh, thank fabulous. you. But it was all her. I just so popped you did in a great at the job. end. And Sam, you. you may um, fly with your last question. You're muted. You're muted. You're muted. I just want to be sure that we have uh, contact information to get in touch with. Lynette and, and Dr. Randy. Um, so I don't even know where you guys are in Florida. Where are you? Sarasota. Oh my gosh, I'm in Longboat Key. So I'll be visiting <laughs> you. Yeah, I look January. forward to meeting you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, Sharon, what are our new email addresses? Um, it's your first name hyphen. Let you want to use the SMH? Oh, no, let me just use Elder written it. We actually have two emails because we still have our old email address when we were at Ear Sinus for Silverstein, but we were actually acquired by the hospital. So we are part of Sarasota Memorial Hospital now. So oh, we are okay. first we are first physicians group, Silverstein of Sarasota Memorial Hospital. And we oh. are in Sarasota, but we also have, we will be in the new Venice Hospital uh, when it opens next week. We won't be there till March, but, um, we are First Physicians Group Silverstein of Sarasota Hospital. And, and um, all right, Linda. What okay. you can do, folks, what you, uh, let me, let me. Uh, but what you can you also. Do, folks, in the chat box, there's the three dots, the three dots in the chat box, and you can save the chat. Okay, perfect. Thank you. That way you don't have to write it down because I guarantee you, you're not going to read your handwriting tomorrow. If, <laughs> and if you if you go to the Sarasota Memorial Hospital and just Google our names, it'll pull up our contact information, which is our first name, hyphenated, last name, at SMH. So you can find us that way too. Okay. All right. I want to thank you guys. We're really way over, over our time. And you guys Sorry. did a fabulous job. Um, it was probably one of the best presentations. I am disappointed that we did not get the number we thought we were going to get. But hey, 45, uh, 47 people. I'm a happy camper. And so um, hopefully um, if anybody else has any questions, feel free to email me. I will type in my email. My name is spelled D-E-B-B-E. -B -B -E. There's no I in my name. It's the legal spelling. Um, and so if you have any questions, you can contact me. And if there's anything I can do to help, if you're interested in this specific topic, please let me know that. And then we will consider that for future presentations. So any other hey. last minute comments? Uh, I have a whole boatload of presentations already made. Uh, so if you, there's a specific topic that you guys are interested in, there's a strong possibility at some point in the last 15 years I've talked One about One of the it. two of us have talked about yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank Hi. you for having us. Um, yeah, thank you. This was an absolute pleasure. I'm uh, looking thank forward you, thank to- Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, have a great evening and happy Thanksgiving. I will yes. wish everybody a uh, happy holidays and hope to see you uh, again. So, so long. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Debbie. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. It was wonderful. Oh, you know, hi. Wonderful. You oh, made me you. like understand your presentation was so understandable about the hearing loss and everything. Oh, I don't know if I'll remember it all, <laughs> but thank you. It's well, how do I see who's talking? This will this is recorded, so you can oh. always go back to the YouTube, and I'll put it on there probably from uh, Monday. 
um because i'm busy for the next couple of days and they'll probably be on youtube monday and then you can watch it a hundred times so you can <laughs> get through okay thank you Bye. or come visit me in person take a road trip yeah thank i'm way you. funnier in person good program <laughs> thank okay. you